Okay, and finally we get to our wonderful speakers. So I'll turn it over to you, Mariam and company. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. This is Liz. I'm going to be the first speaker. Um, it's about 2.30 2 in the afternoon here in Adelaide. Um, so good morning, good afternoon and good evening to everyone else who is joining us and happy um, International Midwifery Day. I'm just going to give you a little bit of an introduction into how we're running this because there's four speakers. So I'm going to do the first few slides, then Mariam's going to come in. Um, Nazarin's going to then provide some information on the Iranian con um, context and then Rouse is in the family issue and then Roz is going to look at the family issues in the Australian context and then we'll open it for questions. And I'm just having a change of plan because Mariam's going to go first. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to hand it over to Mariam, then we're going to go backwards and forwards a little bit. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Mariam, and uh, before everything, I think maybe I need to clarify my accent uh, or where I am originally from, although I live in Australia and I am Australian. I am Iranian as well and I am from north northwest of Iran and the dominant accent uh, which I have is Turkish. You might uh, hear a bit different accent from Nasrin as she has just Persian accent. Now, the plan which we had this plan with Liz that Liz will introduce how we are going to uh, do uh, perform this talk. Then I will just give an introduction to the talk and then myself and Liz, we will go through slides together because you will notice uh, we have different colors for Australia and Iran. Uh, in recent times, birth culture and tradition have been changed uh, and challenged by rapid modernization everywhere in the world and so in Iran and Australia. Nowadays, medicalized and surgical births and the overuse of Western technology are dominant everywhere. And this appears highly valued by some cultures and some populations, especially by Iranians, if we compare it with Australia. And especially the Iranians who they can afford elective C-section uh, surgery, definitely they will adopt that. In this presentation, we will discuss uh, some conflicting social influences and trend among women families as well as the impact of health systems and maternity services, uh, service models, including access, accessibility, funding and social uh, acceptability, as well as that physiological and social event in which uh, family members par participate fully or let's say humanizing birth and humanizing culture to have healthier families and communities. This will improve health outcomes, including physical, emotional, mental, as well as social outcomes, including gender equity, power, education, and also improved uh, life trajectory for communities and families within countries in general, which uh, we will contrast Australia Yes, Iran and uh, here now myself and Liz will go through slides according to the color. As you see, I selected the Australian symbolic color, that's, that's, uh, this gold yellowish and that turquoise blue for Iran. And just follow the colors and you will pick which one is for Iran and which one is for Australia. Okay, there'll be a slight delay as we swap over because we're actually presenting from the same room so we need to make sure each other's mic is muted otherwise you'll hear lots of... Reception is not good. Um, just let us know if that's for myself, Liz, or for um, Mariam. So, 
when we're looking, we're not going to go through everything because you can read the slides, but we want to look at two things in the privacy difference and companionship for birth um, and episiotomy rate within looking at this slide. In Australia, it is um, common practice that every woman gives birth in a private room um, and they can have companions, partners, family members with them. I've had one birth where we had 11 people in the room, it was quite interesting, but that was what they wanted, that's what they found comforting to them and they felt safe having their extended family around them, whereas some women you'll get maybe one or two, but it is very rare that somebody actually gives birth in Australia without having a support person with them, whereas this is actually quite different in Iran. Um, I will highlight uh, other few issues, uh, although we suppose not to talk about what we've already put on slides, but I, later on I decided no, I might need to explain a bit more. One was about the high rate of skilled birth assist, uh, attendance in Iran, which I just want to emphasize that in Iran sometimes it I call it over skilled because in Iran that low risk women, low risk births will be conducted by obstetrician as well, which I'm talking about here. And the other issue which in this uh, skilled birth attendance I like to mention is that lack of childbirth education in Iran, uh, comparing with what we have here in Australia. In Australia we have that uh, routine antenatal classes if a woman had, uh, is in need of breastfeeding education, uh, she will receive a proper and one-on-one -on -one education and many more other uh, sessions, but unfortunately this is not happening at the moment in Iran in a very organized uh, way that we have in uh, Australia. Then for uh, C-section rate in Iran, I need to mention that uh, at the moment the culture and tradition going to the way that if, uh, you know, a pregnant Iranian woman most probably will decide to have an elective C-section with a well-known obstetrician in a private hospital, if she can afford that. And if it's not financially uh, possible to have that C-section through the private system, in the public hospitals, which they are uh, teaching hospitals, uh, the women will labor under uh, different conditions. As uh, Liz mentioned, for example, that lack of privacy, lack of presence of any support person, it's very obvious. And I will touch on routine episiotomy that uh, uh, Liz mentioned, and it's uh, Although according to evidence-based practice, it's a kind of very old-fashioned, maybe older than, uh, more than 30 or 40 years ago, the evidence showed that we don't need to have that routine episiotomy, but unfortunately uh, that routine is at the moment continuing in Iranian uh, hospitals and noliparous and even uh, multiparous women uh, in uh, para two. Uh, they receive routine episiotomy. And uh, there is a question here which says what percentage of babies are born out of hospital uh, at home? In Iran we don't have home births and just in remote areas and some tribes which they keep their tradition, uh, if a home birth is happening, is just because they don't have access to hospitals or skilled birth attendants. Otherwise, even privately practicing midwives, they are not allowed to uh, provide home births. Therefore, the birth will uh, happen in the hospital or in the remote areas, very remote areas, maybe at home. And, okay, I will move to the next slide and I will give the
sorry, I just muted myself. When we're looking at the types of people who are present within um, a birth, we have generally the group midwifery group practice model. In Australia, we have shared care, which is shared between midwives and local GPs. Um, and we have private obstetricians, and we have obstetricians who work in the public sector as well. So depending on which model of care a woman is going through will depend on her flexibility to walk around, to have water births. Um, some uh, end up being on the beds as opposed to being able to adopt any position of choice. We've got every birth that occurs in Australia has a qualified, skilled birth attendant there, be it a midwife or a obstetrician and we're finding that um, doulas are increasing as well. And we've got the increasing group practices and most of our group practices have a waiting list that's actually longer than their physical capacity to take women into their records to actually give birth. And once with the records and the evidence um, research supporting midwifery-led care as well. We have quite a lot of obstetricians who are really quite woman friendly with working with the midwives to allow their decisions in helping the women advocate for the women. Um, and the healthcare costing is through the, we've got a universal healthcare system in Australia and so they can choose to be in the public system or the private system where they pay and home birth is different but Ros will be able to talk to you more about that um, because that's very much her area of um, practices. Uh, regarding the uh, system availability of childbirth and uh, different uh, uh, maternity care system, in Iran usually it will be just a private system or public health system. Uh, there is no way of shared care or uh, opportunities for, for example, GP or midwife uh, working together. Although what I am presenting uh, in these slides is from published literature and later on Nasrin will explain about the new efforts that uh, at the moment is uh, happening uh, by some uh, except, uh, efforts through government and also Ministry of Health and also uh, with uh, that private uh, practicing midwives. In Iran, we have private practicing midwives which their number are almost maybe less than a few hundreds. Uh, and, uh, uh, considering that we don't have that midwifery-led clinics uh, in Iran, uh, uh, midwifery uh, profession as a, uh, how to say, uh, and context of midwifery practice, uh, that lack of professional autonomy and also power uh, within the mainstream health system uh, puts a bit of let's say extra pressure on pregnant women, on birthing women and uh, in most of the time in private hospitals and even in most of the public hospitals the birth will be uh, controlled and guided with obstetricians. And uh, all of these, you know, lack of a different approach, uh, providing different opportunities uh, or maternity models for women uh, pushes uh, pregnant women to uh, accept that C-section is the best, uh, best and easiest one for her to go through. So when we're looking at the um, demand that's coming from women, the, the Australian healthcare practice, both in especially midwifery group practice, but also in our public um, settings is very much woman-centred. And we're having increasing continuity of care models. And it's something that our student nurses and, in, and also our student doctors 
um, especially in Adelaide and through the Flinders University, are having and encouraging the continuity and understanding that the care of the woman is increased when you know that woman, when you've got that rapport with that woman. And we've got increasing women wanting to have what they deem as natural birth experiences, low intervention. We have an increasing hypnobirthing um, community that is very much trying to reduce the interventions from when they start, though we still have a high intervention rate with induction of labour. And depending on where you go through, there is some negotiation over post dates that you can negotiate when you're induced, however, with some private obstetricians and in some public venues, then they have policies that they will not go over 10 days post dates and you will get induced regardless. Um, and that's an agreement that is usually done there. Midwifery group practices, most of them um, are connected with a public hospital. So um, yes, then that's going to be coming from the policy. Sorry, I've just seen a student nurse term. That was my error. I did mean student midwife, my correction. I teach both nurses and midwives, and so that's my, um, my mistake. So we, it's very lucky here, though the caesarean um, section rate is still 30% in Australia, um, and some hospitals have lower, and our private hospitals um, have higher, and some obstetricians will have differing rates as well. And that is very much on their way of practice. And it is very much different each hospital and also each state as well. Oh, okay. I can read some of the questions in the chat box, uh, which they asked about the culture and also continuity of care. Uh, before. Uh, explaining the parts which I am going to do in for this slide I just uh, going to mention that yes the culture you know over the last 30 years why or for what reason the car the culture the birth culture in Iran changed uh, dramatically is one of the I think driving factors for that high level of c-section as over the last 30 years, yes, medicalized birth models for healthy uh, pregnant women is equal to a dominant care model, which a uh, good example is that C-section. And also about continuity of care model in Iran, unfortunately, it's not possible for uh, women to go through, for example, midwifery care model and have continuity of care. If she need, uh, she wants to have continuity model. It's just through private health system and just uh, via obstetrician. Uh, but in Iranian system, even when mother is prepared for normal birth, unfortunately, the healthcare environment and health providers are not ready or able to provide for women's needs and. Uh, the thing is, usually obstetricians will instead uh, insist and ask women to use that uh, uh, quick, safe, and easy way, and not to suffer of pain. Which later on, Nasrin will talk about some uh, family issues in uh, childbirth culture in Iran. And as I mentioned already, in Iran, only women who can't afford the high cost of C-section now have to go through the pain. And unfortunately, in uh, Iranian culture at the moment, natural childbirth has somehow become synonymous with uh, social stature for some women. So as you can see that the caesarean rate in Australia over this 10 year period, which are the latest results that we could get, has stayed fairly stable with a slight decrease in non-instrumental vaginal birth um, and a steady increase or steady rate of vaginal birth. And when we go to the next slide, this kind of makes a little bit more sense when we break it down into maternal age, remoteness, and socioeconomic. And we're seeing an increase in the age of 
women having children and also an increase in the comorbidities as well. And so that's making with pre-existing health conditions, with increasing body mass, with increasing congenital um, heart diseases, for example, with diabetes, that this is contributing to the increasing in cesarean section rate for the older women. And interestingly enough, the remoteness doesn't make that much difference when you're looking at the major cities where about 80% of Australians live within an urban setting and looking at our very remote. And with a lot of our remote areas, they are actually directed into um, bigger centres for their care between a week or two weeks before their um, due date so that they've got that coverage there. And we have a similar caesarean section rate between the socioeconomic levels, though we have a slightly increased rate with natural birthing um, in the lower socioeconomic rate, which is comparison to the next slide, which is about Iran. Okay, here is an example, a public hospital. It's uh, from this paper, which is published in 2012. And the rate of uh, C-section in private hospitals will be, is higher, definitely due to that economic incentives uh, for the medical profession. As you see, almost 30 years ago, just 10% of uh, children were born by C-section in Iran. And now it appears to be a very normal way. Although from 2015, a few years after 2009, the Iranian Ministry of Health and Medical Education announced that uh, natural childbirth would be free in public hospitals uh, in the hope that uh, to promote that physiological child, childbirth as well as the main reason was to increase the fertility rate. But Many women, uh, women now see vaginal births as uh, outstated, uh, outdated and they prefer the convenience of a C-section. Uh, the lack of a uh, transparent system for public report, uh, reporting of health information in Iran is very obvious and it made it uh, impossible for me to access the recent childbirth data. But according to UN Women's Reports in February 2016, the uh, average C-section rate in Iran was 78% and uh, in public hospitals it was 100%. And when I was talking with Nasrin in this regard, she said, oh no, she read in some uh, reports that it's 50%, but uh, apparently they are not uh, approved report. And okay, and Linda here asked what was the government's reason for promoting natural childbirth. I might, it's better not to go <laughs> maybe in that area, but apparently they feeling that Iran has the capacity, opportunity to have a population of 150 million, not 80 million, and also they are, I think they don't care about, the, for example, uh, income, education, anything else. They are just at the moment considering the population, and they started to encourage childbirth uh, and increasing fertility fertility from that, but the other uh, issue for encouraging physiological childbirth, I think it was the uh, reports from uh, World Health Organization about the high C-section rates in Iran, which uh, I think they asked Iran to decrease C-section rates or Iran will not get support from WHO, and uh, they are They've started to do some stuff, but how successful are uh, they in this uh, 
I would say motion uh, Nasrin will talk about that but it's in a very early stages at the moment and then and as you see there is another uh, issue in uh, uh, maternity system in Iran and might be one of the main reasons to have that high uh, C-section rate and it's the um, mal distribution of workforce and this is again a, a public hospital and as you see the ratio of obstetricians to midwives uh, it's uh, very strange we have higher obstetricians in uh, that hospital comparing with midwife, uh, midwives and Further, or the other main issue on top of this small distribution of workforce is that uh, neither midwives uh, nor obstetricians, they don't learn uh, midwifery models of care or even they don't witness uh, physiological childbirth. And in Iran, midwives, they uh, their textbooks are the same as textbooks that obstetricians, they uh, use them for uh, during their study and practice and therefore all that they learn uh, it's medicalized childbirth. So when we're looking at the continuing on about the education of midwifery in Australia we have four-year um, education course for direct entry midwives. We also have a, an abbreviated RN entry course for those who want become dual degree. To, and that gives you a Bachelor of Midwifery. However, that doesn't mean that you can work. You need to be registered with our national authority and get a practicing certificate to be able to practice within Australia. Our graduates who come out currently um, are also need to do some external postgraduate work and then they can apply to be uh, do postgraduate studies to become endorsed to give medications. We aren't prescribed um, as from initial graduation, though there are some universities that are looking to include that, but at the moment it's mostly postgraduate um, and that the training is independent to our regulatory body and it's separate from the government body which is very much different to Iran and we've just had recent changes in the number of continuities that students are expected to do in their training um, and also how many births, so normal vaginal births and complex births and neonatal assessments um, and that is the same regardless of whether you do a direct entry course or whether you do an RN entry course and abbreviated, it's a very, very busy time for RNs coming through. But it's once again, the qualifications that you end up with are different due to the governing bodies. Okay, in Iran from uh, 1980, since the integration of healthcare delivery with medical education and the establishment of the Ministry of Health and Medical Education, it's been the responsibility of University of Medical Sciences to train midwives and place them in health centers, clinics and hospitals. In Iran, midwifery education is direct entry for almost last 40 years. Uh, which is four years uh, of a, it, which is a, a four-year course, and the regulatory authority is Ministry of Health and Medical Education. As I said, uh, this uh, ministry they train midwives and they put them in the practice. And opposite to Australia, until recently in Iran. Uh, just graduation from the course was uh, enough to practice as a midwife. We didn't have to have registration, although we had midwifery registration body, but uh, we have many midwives in Iran which they are practicing at the moment, but they don't have registration number because the Ministry of Health, they know exactly uh, who's graduated from there. and 
opposite to uh, Australia, I think when a midwife is uh, graduating from this course, she has the prescription rights for a small formulary, midwifery formulary. Uh, they they have the qualification and the skills to do episiotomy and to uh, do suturing as we routinely use that in Iran, as well as, for example, IV cannulation, which here in Australia, midwives, they need to have further uh, education or uh, training for uh, being able to do this extra, let's say, skills. And what else about? But the main thing, I think, for midwifery practice in Iran will be that, uh, you know, this institutional there's medical control, hierarchical relationship, as well as the way that we get trained under the authority of Ministry of Health, it limits midwives' autonomy and severely challenges the promotion of normal labor and birth because we will get, uh, we will uh, be, um, I'll say, trained in the same hospitals as we have that. Uh, obstetrician students as well and therefore everything gets to be medicalized and under the control of obstetrician team. Now, uh, from now on, Nasrin will talk about the women and her family issues in Iran as well as the new efforts and what's happening in promoting uh, that physiological childbirth. I, I know Nasrin and uh, some midwives, they are uh, very active in promoting uh, physiological childbirth and she will talk about their success and the challenges that they have. Okay. Hello everybody, thank you for introducing me and uh, Maya. Uh, yes, uh, I will go on with a uh, woman and her family issues in Iran. Uh, as Maya mentioned, from 2014 government tries to increase the fertility rate by promoting normal and physiological births. However, in modern Iran, there are new cultural issues, beliefs, and influences, and uh, influences within the women and uh, within the woman and uh, from her family, which impacts women's attitude towards childbirth. Some examples are Severe fear of labor pain, lack of childbirth education, planned status by medical staff, absence of uh, human rights in childbirth, and, and lack of social support at childbirth. But many women, um, many women in Iran, uh, are turning away from natural childbirth despite policy efforts to increase rates to uh, free government services from physiological birth. In this part, I will highlight some issues around uh, improving and uh, facilitation physiological birth in Iran, uh, which hope gradually will uh, contribute to cultural changes toward childbirth. Here are some suggestions to uh, reconnect with physiological birth and facilitate normal childbirth in, your, in Iran, which is the uh, iron. Uh, childbirth education uh, modifications, uh, improvement in midwifery education, implementing midwifery leads uh, uh, implementing midwifery lead care models, and Importantly, changing obstetrics income uh, stream. And without human rights, we believe that none of the above strategies will work. But what about recent uh, improvement in childbirth in Iran? Here in Iran, mother can have doula at birth these days, uh, which is interesting here in Iran, uh, somehow is unique, I think. In Iran, most of the laws are midwives because a mother prefer a midwife who monitors her pregnancy during nine months uh, uh, 
accompany her in labor work as well. It shows uh, how much trust and emotion um, uh, between them during uh, began to grow between them. I mean, mother and midwife uh, during pregnancy control. And uh, the second is uh, um, uh, changing woman attitude towards physiological birth. The midwives uh, uh, nowadays are aware of power of educational uh, education, uh, you know, system power of education here, and uh, uh, you know, and uh, they now. Uh, they have to put time and effort for uh, educating women for physiological birth. And I can see every single midwife here in Iran is trying to be a physiological birth uh, promoter. Also, uh, they can legally uh, they can legally establish a center as a midwifery and physiological birth. Uh, consulting and instruction and uh, instruction uh, center. They can, they, I mean, they can get this uh, permission legally and start for uh, train uh, training w women for physiological birth in the private uh, midwifery consulting center. Uh, and the third is facilitating physiological birth, like. Uh, decreasing uh, episiotomy rate, uh, choosing a birth position by mother, which we didn't have. Uh, and uh, as, a, as a midwife student, uh, those days, um, uh, while I was a midwife student, I, I um, remember that uh, we rule uh, the mother and uh, we uh, told her to what position is better for her. But uh, nowadays, uh, uh, choosing birth position uh, is with uh, with uh, mother, uh, with mother opinion, I think, and uh, decreasing CS rate down to uh, fifty percent in some centers, and the attendance of family husband at birth as well, which we didn't have it, but nowadays uh, we do have in. Um, some even uh, public and uh, uh, centers and also private centers. Uh, and one of uh, uh, one of the um, attendants asked why why you use the uh, midwifery student because we have uh, the um, special faculty as midwifery um, faculty and it is not uh, a here in Iran, we, you know, nurses are uh, in different faculty, and midwives uh, are in uh, midwife students are in the uh, different faculty as well. And we are uh, graduated as midwives, not as a nurse, as midwives. Uh, so uh, I think I've finished my part. If there is uh, any question, I will. Uh, able to answer you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, so we're, we're up to questions now. Do you have any more slides? Okay. Can everyone hear me well, I hope? Um, I'm going to be, welcome and happy Midwives Day everybody. Um, I'm Roz from Australia here in sunny Queensland. I'm going to speak to our last three slides quickly so we can have some time for questions. I guess the thing to say uh, from Australian midwives perspective is that pregnancy and childbirth is a public health issue that is profoundly affected by social determinants of health. We have a very good national data collection set in our country and we can see that clearly from the data we have. So therefore we would argue that public health initiatives to address chronic disease prevention must take account of social determinants of health and the intergenerational effects of early life influences. 
and pregnancy, birth and the postnatal period are all critical times for adopting strategies that can optimise a healthy start to life. The example provided in this slide is um, in relation to one of the issues, the rising um, public health issues for midwifery and pregnant women in Australia, and it's only one. So the biophysical issue relating to increasing body mass index, nearly 50% now, half of all women in Australia um, suffer from um, what we would see as a um, perhaps a disease of, of affluence, lifestyle affluence and um, large BMI results in significant pregnancy complexity and complications for these women and their babies. This includes um, the increasing um, risks of diabetes and then also for the um, offspring or babies of those families across their life course and life trajectory. And despite our overall low maternal mortality rate in Australia, we have very significantly different outcomes for different groups of women and babies related directly to ethnicity, to First Nation status, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander mothers and babies, and outcomes on all indices are significantly poorer for these groups. They include higher mortality and morbidity, particularly higher rates of preterm birth, low birth weight and death up to um, the under five year age group. Tobacco smoking is also an associated risk for women and um, significantly large numbers in, in these groups are uh, also um, had this uh, particular challenge. So studies by several large research groups in Australia, the Murdoch Group on the Eastern Seaboard and the Telethon Institute, Professor Fiona Stanley's group on the Western Seaboard, also show that culturally and linguistically diverse women have reduced equitable access to services and rural and remote indices also show this for women who reside in geographically um, challenged areas of our country. The other thing I want to emphasise, um, particularly because it's not spoken about very often, but a significant growing psychosocial issue is the burden of suicide in pregnant um, and pregnant women and women who've given birth. In Queensland now where I'm working, um, the last uh, three year review of perinatal statistics show that the leading cause of maternal death is suicide. Um, and that's significant. Uh, some of these suicides related to post-termination of pregnancy and for other women the, the suicides were during the antenatal period while the women were pregnant and for a number of other women they are associated with perinatal mental health conditions in the first 12 months after giving birth. The other issue that is also a significant issue is domestic violence. Um, it is a, a growing problem in Australia and it cuts across all socio-demographic um, sectors. So, as you can see, we probably have some different challenges um, to, to other areas of, of the world, although some of these things may be more common but are just not spoken about and they involve gender equity issues and women's, women's rights essentially. Um, so the other thing, just back to the models of care, um, you can see listed on the slide, you know, the overuse of analgesics in labour, especially epidural, which relates to our high medicalisation of birth in this country. Um, childbirth education is a variable quality for, for some families. Um, some would argue it's more a socialisation exercise in some facilities um, rather than a, a true education for women. Um, in Australia, most uh, women's partners, uh, men, do attend uh, the birth as this is um, a cultural expectation of most women. Um, and another significant factor I must emphasise is the very different uh, intervention levels between public and private uh, maternity care models in Australia. If you, uh, we have a universal health system as Liz mentioned, so our funding is varied, about 50% of people have private health insurance but we have universal access for all. Um, while the majority of women do give birth in public facility uh, hospitals, 
um, about 70% or up, of upward and greater. If you go to a private hospital to have your um, baby, your risk of having a caesarean doubles automatically. So there are significant variants in the rates of medicalisation and iatrogenic interventions in different sectors um, in this country. Um, I guess we would just emphasise as well that social support at childbirth is expected um, in this country. It's variable across different models of childbirth, but as midwives we know that respect and kindness are core values for providing woman-centred care and that often happens best through the social model of birth and the midwifery woman partnership and relationship that is developed over the course of a pregnancy, um, the support during childbirth and then during the postnatal period. So whilst Australia often is seen as a lucky country, pregnancy and childbirth um, are still very much political issues um, and very more so for different groups of women. Um, because funding of maternal and infant services in Australia do not necessarily optimise care equitably for all women and groups. Um, in an area where I'm living and working at the moment, in the southern metropolitan area of, um, of Queensland, one in ten women have little or no contact with health services during pregnancy, i.e. they actively avoid um, mainstream service delivery because um, there isn't access to culturally safe or appropriate care. We have large numbers of Aboriginal and ATSI women, large numbers of Pacifica Island um, and Māori women, and also so increasingly large amounts of women who come from um, other areas of the world who do not find the services on offer um, palatable or, or offering them culturally safe care. So this is a, a highly significant issue for us in terms of providing safe quality maternity services that, um, that are going to affect the life health outcomes um, of, of these children and their families. Um, improvement strategies, I think certainly like Amas Bina mentioned by our Iranian colleagues, promoting the benefits of physiological vaginal birth as a public health strategy is critical. We need to implement evidence and government policy. We need a midwife for all pregnant childbearing women and we need to expand access to the midwifery maternity model because only 8% of women um, get access in Australia and certainly we need to ensure culturally safe access to the midwifery model for vulnerably and socially disadvantaged women. So in concluding um, the presentation, I think our our concluding point is that midwifery is a public health strategy which will improve intergenerational health of families for women wherever they live in the world. Um, it has long, short and long term health benefits um, which can offer significant public health gains, save the health system a lot of money and lead to higher satisfaction and healthier um, communities and families. I'm going to finish now so we can have some time for questions. Thank you, Roz, and thank you to your team. It's a wonderful demonstration of how um, fabulous this software is because we not only have participants listening in from all over the world, but um, we have presenters that were in different locations presenting together. So we have time for one very quick question. If someone would like me to give the mic to you, um, in particular, you can put your hand up um, or you could type a question um, there we will only have time for one because we've got to move uh, get set up for the next one. Thanks, Roz. Happy Midwives Day to you too. You can raise your hand if you, you can find it up uh, the icon in the top tab. Dale's still got a tick. To say you like something. I'm not sure what. Uh, just give. Uh, we've got a lot of people typing, so I'll just give them one moment. Hopefully a question will pop up there. Okay, so maybe it was uh, thank yous that everyone has been typing. Okay, uh, 
Yes, so someone's just clarifying, I think, um, that you said the leading cause of maternal death was suicide, Ros. I think people are shocked by that. Did, did you want to um, make any further comment on that? Oh, sorry, I was typing. That's right. I forgot I've got a microphone. <laughs> yes, um, it's not what we expect to hear. Um, it certainly, it varies around the country, but in Queensland, yes, when I was looking at the maternal mortality review here of the 40 deaths across maternal deaths across a three-year period, and our maternal mortality is low, um, eight were by maternal suicide and the other eight were actually related to other uh, chronic health conditions and, and malignancies. So it's not Yes, it's not what we expect, um, but I think it's related to, again, these social determinants of health and issues um, that are not very visible often, which, which relate directly to women's rights um, and the, the relationships and their access to resources um, and power and um, support or, or social services often or not. Thank you. All right. We will wind it up there. That, that's um, really a sobering um, point to end on. But thank you for an absolutely fascinating session. I think the, uh, the differences and the similarities uh, are just so fascinating. So thank you once again. Thank you to all the participants. Uh, just got a couple of slides to, to finish with here. Thank you. Uh, so I'll uh, be turning off the recording now.